Hi guys, in this video, I'm going to talk about learning rate decay. So most optimization algorithms of neural networks use some form of stochastic gradient descent. Now, the size of the step we take in the opposite direction of the gradient is the hyperparameter called the learning rate. And it's probably the most important hyperparameter uh, when training neural networks. We don't want it to be too small and we don't want it to be too big. Now, we cannot plot the value of the objective function of the loss or of the accuracy over the entire parameter space because we have usually a lot of parameters, all the weights and biases, we have a lot of parameters. Uh, in very simple cases where we only have one or two parameters, we can plot it, but in real architectures, we can't. If we could see the objective function over the entire parameter space, we could just find the optimal parameters immediately. We would see the place, we would see the value of parameters that give the least error and choose that. But of course that's impossible. So in reality, we have no idea if the step we take is good or not. It might be too big or it might be too small. And I'll show you uh, what it means to be too small and what it means to be too big. Um, but again, we can't visualize the entire parameter space. But the same concepts uh, remain and apply also for a 1D case. So I'm now going to show you uh, as if we only had one parameter. But of course, in reality, we have a lot of parameters. So what does it mean to be too small? So suppose, um, yeah, in the x-axis here, we have the parameter, let's say w. And in the y-axis, we have the loss function, yeah? So the loss. If we take steps in the direction opposite of the gradient, and let's say we here, the step will be here. So we will move w from this into this direction. But how much will we move? Well, if our learning rate step is too small, we might move it really small. So we might move from here to here, and then to here, and then to here, and then to here, and then to here. And it will take us a lot, a lot of time, or it will be too long. And the convergence will be too slow. And in some extreme cases, it might be that we won't get to the real optimum, the minimum here, uh, even in a very long time. So this is one problem. Another problem is if we get stuck in a local minima. So again, suppose that this is the W and this is the loss. Yeah? And suppose that this is the global optimum, the global minima, and this is a local minima. And we take steps from here. Let's say we take this step and this step and this step and this step and then this step and this step. We we end up here. So we may we might move back and forth here a bit, but in the end we end up in this point. And we think we we found the optimum, but it, actually we are in a local minima. And if we had bigger steps, then maybe we would jump from here to here and then from here to here and then from here to here. And then maybe like this, and we will bounce back here, back and forth, but eventually we will stay somewhere uh, here and we will get a better optimum. Okay, so this is what is the problem of being too small. What is the problem of taking of being too big? So one problem is that we might bounce back and forth uh, without really uh, improving. So supposedly that we are here and we are taking a step, but the step brings us all the way here. And then we take another step, now this time in this direction, and it brings us here again. And then we take another step and we come back to here. So we basically jump back and forth on the same place and we never manage to reach the actual minimum. So this is one problem. And this is in 1D, but it also is applicable, for example, here in 2D, you see that we are going like this. Okay, so it's not that we are bouncing back and forth, we are bouncing uh, around the minimum. So let's say this is the minimum and we are bouncing like this, etc. And it doesn't have to be like this. It can be also that we are going like this uh, um, and we're just, this is the minimum and we are kind of circling around it uh, in 2D. And in higher dimension, the bouncing is basically uh, going in all directions around a certain point. Now, in some cases, we can actually go away from the objective. So here, uh, the points are that 
the gradient is actually bigger here than it is here. So the gradient goes, uh, becomes higher. So if we start from a point here, and let's say we take a step that is too big and we reach here, then now um, the step is always multiplied by the gradient, but since the gradient became bigger, okay, it's like, it's higher here, then the next step will be bigger. So the next step will take us maybe here. And then here the gradient is even bigger. So once we multiply it by the same learning rate step, we will jump here and here. And so here we are actually going away from the objective, which is this point over here. This is the minimum. And we are actually going away from it because um, the gradients are becoming bigger and bigger. And even though the learning step stays the same, it's too big. And instead of bouncing, we are actually getting further and further away from the optimum. So we see that basically we know the gradient does give us the direction of the step, but we never know if the step is too big. It's as if we are walking blindfold and we know the direction, but we don't know how much we have to walk, if we should take a small step or a big step. And we don't know the value until we put our foot down. So once we put our foot down, we know, oh, we got higher or we get lower. We just know that, okay, somewhere in this direction, I know that if I'll take a step, I will go down. But I don't know if I should take a small step or a big step. So it could be that I take a small step, but I go down too slowly, or that I go down and I get stuck in a very uh, small optimum. And it could be that I take a big step, but I overshoot the objective. So I go, so I miss the minimum. And instead of going down, I go up or, or I don't go as down as I could. So one way to look at it is that actually it's a question of resolution. So when we are zooming out, then maybe we want to take big steps. Yeah, Maybe we want to take relatively big steps so we can jump from point to point. And yeah, it could be that we bounce back. But once we are here, we are starting to bounce back and forth. Maybe it's uh, reasonable to lower the resolution, take a smaller step in each direction, and maybe start doing something like this, you know. And then once we're here, maybe if we zoom in, then like a fractal, we will get again this kind of uh, image. And again, we want to maybe lower the resolution even more. And so this is kind of the intuition behind what is called learning rate decay. So if we see that we don't improve our metric for some time and we are bouncing basically back and forth, then maybe it's time to reduce the learning rate and zoom in on the specific area that we are at in order to maybe improve the metric that we are doing. Now we can do this when with measuring some metric, usually the validation loss, but sometimes this is done blindly. So we simply start with a high learning rate and as the learning proceeds, we decrease the learning rate. If we are doing this blindly, then it's a good uh, policy to maybe run the training at least once without learning rate decay, to have some baseline, which makes sure that we didn't decay too early and ended up in a worse local minimum. Now there's all kinds of decay schemes. So there can be a simple step function where every few epochs we lower the learning rate. There can be, it can be a linear function where every epoch we decay by a bit. It can be an exponential function. I will show you this now in code. Just a, a note that there are some papers that also suggest more complicated and advanced learning rate scheduling. For example, cyclic learning rate, SGDR, et cetera, which can also increase the learning rate at times but we might cover this in a future video, not in this video. I'll just mention that uh, the intuition behind why we might want to increase the learning rate is that, well, until now we talked about some problems like local minima or going too slow or too fast, but sometimes the problem might be that, yeah, that we have something maybe like this and when we have saddle point. So it could be that we are stuck in a saddle point and we are not converging because we are moving really slow and increasing the learning rate can actually get us away from the saddle point and continue the learning, continue our journey to the real optimum. Okay, so I switched into code. I will load the necessary libraries 
um, make some basic feedforward neural network that takes 784 dimension, decreases it to 64 and then 10. This will be used later on the MNIST data. And here I will show the simple step learning rate. The way you do it is from the Optim uh, model. You call lrscheduler.stepLR. Uh, you give it the optimizer step size, which is a counter. So it means every time we will call the scheduler, after 10 times, it will reduce the learning rate. And by how much? By a factor of 0 0.1. And if we do this on a without real training, I just show it here uh, as if we had train, it will look something like this. Yeah, so at first we start with 0 0.1, we go to 0 0.01, then 0 0.001, and then it's really hard to look. So we can also plot it on a log scale. Uh, and then it looks like this. Okay, and we see that it's indeed after 10 epochs, it goes down by a factor of 10. And it does so for the whole training. The linear scheduler, we have to call linear LR. We give it an optimizer. We gave it a start factor and an end factor and how much iterations there are between. So since we are training for 1,000 epochs, I will give it that the total is 1,000. So it will basically do a linear interpolation between 1 and 0 0.01. And this is how it would look. The exponential scheduler, um, yeah, we have to give it the gamma. And it will multiply by this gamma after each uh, step. So this is how it would look. And again, it might be a bit too drastic. So maybe a log scale would be better. And then in a log scale, it will look like this. Now, PyTorch has a special reduce learning rate on plateau. You give it an optimizer like before, you specify the mode because you will give it a matrix. So since here we will give it the accuracy, we want to maximize the accuracy. Then you give it a factor of how much you want to reduce uh, once it plateaus and a patience variable that says, well, how many rounds where we didn't improve is it considered that we reached a plateau? So here I set it to three, which means that if we didn't improve past the best metric, in this case, the, past, the best accuracy, if we didn't improve past the best metric for three rounds, we will consider it a plateau and reduce the learning rate by a factor of 0 0.5. So multiply it by 0 0.5, basically. And here again, I'm emulating training. I'm not really training. I'm starting with some accuracy of 50, and then I do a random walk. So each epoch, I'm moving the accuracy and I'm adding a random number between minus one and one. Yeah, and you can see that, yeah, at the 12th epoch, it was it realized that it's not improving. So it reduced the uh, learning rate from 0 0.1 to 0 0.05. And then on the 16th round, and then every few rounds it did it. And this is how it looks. Yeah, this is the graph of it. Now let's compare it on real data. So we'll use the MNIST data that I used a lot in this series. I use a subset of only 20,000 uh, samples from the 60,000 for the training set and only 4,000 from the 10,000 for the validation set. We'll train for 25 epochs. The base learning rate will be 0 0.5. And here I train without a scheduler and I keep track of the validation accuracy and the learning rate. So here there's the train loop. Uh, I'm computing the train accuracy. Here's the validation loop. I'm computing the validation accuracy. I'm adding the validation accuracy to the list and I'm adding the learning rate to the list. And then I do the same thing with uh, step LR scheduler. The only difference is that, yeah, after each epoch calling the scheduler and telling it that we did a step. So here I set the step size again to be 10. So after 10 steps, it will lower the learning rate by multiplying it by 0.5. Okay, here I do the same with the linear learning rate. I set up a linear learning rate scheduler and I call step on it after each round. Here I do the same with exponential learning rate, the same, and I call uh, step on it after each epoch. And finally, on the reduce on plateau, I do the same. I do the patience of three, a factor of 0 0.5, a mode of max, because we will give it the accuracy. So here I'm calling step, but I have to pass it the accuracy as well. So I'm calling step and I'm passing it the validation accuracy. And you can see here that during training, it also outputs, oh, by the way, the validation accuracy didn't improve in three rounds. And we can see indeed that this was the best validation accuracy. And then this was below, this was lower, this was lower. 
So it realized, okay, I didn't improve in three rounds, let's reduce the learning rate, and then it does it. Then you can see that it did it again here. Now let's plot everything. This is the learning rates of the different uh, schemes. This is the constant, it stated 0.5. This is the step, after 10 rounds it re reduced, and after 10 rounds it reduced again. This is the linear uh, learning rate. This is the exponential learning rate, and this is the reduced on plateau. So this actually, um, this was the only thing that was not completely blind. Here we just reduced it blindly without looking at the validation matrix. Uh, but here we reduced it once uh, because the validation matrix didn't improve in three rounds, and then we reduced it again because, again, it didn't improve in three rounds. And this is the validation accuracy versus the different schemes. The like, constant and the decay uh, they remained the same until about here, where the learning rate decay was first uh, really reduced the learning rate. And here they start to become different. We see that overall in this particular case, on this particular problem with these particular hyperparameters and architecture, we see that um, the blue is kind of mostly down and the other methods kind of get a bit of a better validation accuracy. But know that your mileage might vary, and in different problems, it might be that the constant is actually better. But overall, there is this intuition that in most cases, we might get some benefits if we lower the learning rate as we train longer and longer. Yeah, so this was all for this video. I hope it gave you some intuition about the learning rate decay. Uh, I hope you enjoyed, and see you in the next one.